Hey everyone, I'm Lee Jin along with Nathan Vachez, and this is Means of Creation, a show all about the passion economy and the future of work. This show is produced by Every, a writer's collective focused on business. So with the new year, we are starting something new on this show. Um, For the next few episodes, we are going to be piloting a series of Web3 explainers, unpacking some of the fundamental concepts of Web3 from first principles. The goal is to really explore different topics, trends, and projects that people want to learn more about but find really confusing today. Another way I try to position the concept for this show is asking all the dumb questions that you were afraid to ask out loud. Um, You might be afraid to ask it, but we will ask it on everyone's behalf. And in order to ask those questions, we'll be bringing on a slate of new guest experts who have been studying the space for a really long time to explain concepts without the jargon or bias tribalism. So these episodes are going to be a little bit shorter than our normal ones, but hopefully packed with foundational knowledge and information that you need to understand any concept in crypto. So in today's episode, we're really excited to be joined by Nat Eliason. Nat is a writer, crypto engineer, and educator. Um, He teaches a very popular course called DeFi Orientation, which helps people enter the DeFi space and earn money from their crypto assets. He also helps various crypto projects with their tokenomics and smart contract development. And we're going to be delving all into DeFi or decentralized finance and analyzing its potential to radically change the financial system as we know it. Oh, yeah. And before we dive in, important note that Nat also writes Almanac, which is a newsletter about DeFi, tokenomics, yield farming, gas fees, and many other topics, which you can find at every.to. Um, So let's dive in. Welcome, Nat. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. We should really just rebrand Almanac to D-Friday because that's basically what it is at this point. But Yeah. (laughs) It's all DeFi. Yeah, all DeFi every Friday or most Fridays. But yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us and being here. It's awesome to see the sort of like every crossover episode happening. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, let's do it. Definitely the every mafia. Um, anyway, so to kick off, let's just start from the basics. If you were to explain it to your grandmother or your mother or someone who doesn't know much about crypto, how would you explain DeFi? What is DeFi? I think the simplest way to explain it would be everything you know from normal finance, banking, saving, investing, lending, but entirely online and w- entirely without having to deal with other people. It's kind of hard to fully encapsulate it. If we're talking at a like explain it to my grandmother level, I'm trying to think yeah. the, the, the easiest way to frame that because as soon as you start to say like banking without other people involved, it gets extremely confusing. Uh, so <laughs> we might we might say like you know, it, it would be like banking without the bankers or right. completely automated finance might be another way to put it. Uh, but the kind of like the the degree to which it's an entirely new paradigm almost makes it impossible to do some of the ELI five uh, descriptions. Or I'm just really bad at explaining it uh, to somebody like their five. That That's very possible, too. I like that definition. So, okay, so like traditional financial s- services, but all online and without the traditional financial institutions. So instead of a bank that is paying you interest or lending you money or allowing you to take out a mortgage or whatever it is, instead, who is on the other side providing these services? Yeah, it's just all code. So it's just completely automated systems handling the things that are normally handled by hundreds or thousands of people. The The comparison that I like to make is there are a few of these really big DeFi protocols like Compound or Aave that let you quote unquote invest your funds or like lend them out for other people to borrow against, earn interest on your money basically, that have more funds under management than a service like Wealthfront or Vanguard, but with one one hundredth or one one thousandth of the number of employees because they've basically replaced individuals making the decisions with code making predictable and you know repeated decisions how how does that work because i would guess that you know a lot of banks in different places they use code to automate a lot of what they do and sure they've got employees that you know manage the people writing the code and they've got customer service people and whatever but like it's not as if we're replacing 
a purely like non automated at all system that's just humans doing things with with a one that's purely run by code where there's no humans because I guess somebody had to write that code. How how is it different like operationally? I think the best example would be getting a loan, right? Mm. So if you want a loan to buy a house, you can go to the bank and you can say, I want to buy this house that's worth $200,000. I want you to cover 80% of it and I'll give you the other 20% of it in cash. And then they look at all of your you know, income and your tax returns and everything. And they say, okay, yeah, we're pretty sure you can cover the payments on this and we're happy to give you this loan right. and here's the money. But you've got to go through all this paperwork. You have to deal with an individual. The banker that you get on a given day might affect your outcome. Uh, there's a lot of kind of like decision points in the system. Whereas, uh, you know, if you're going to get a loan against your crypto, uh, it's completely fixed, right? So there's basically no decision making. It's he, you have, you know, this much ether and you can borrow this much USDC, you know, a dollar based stable coin against it, uh-huh. but you can only borrow 70% and it doesn't matter who you are. And that rate, the rate that you have to pay an in interest could change at any moment because it's going to be variable, but nobody has to approve it. Nobody has to sign off on it. It's just, you can borrow 70% as long as you're borrowing less than that your collateral is safe. As soon as the amount that you're borrowing is worth more than 70%, your collateral gets taken away. You know, for now, at least it's much simpler, more rigid process, which allows for the rules to be fixed in place. And we're not, and there's no, uh, what you could call like under collateralization where you can get a loan for more than what you already have. Uh, Okay, let's walk that back a little bit because we like I, I went way out there. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I think it would be really helpful to sort of paint the picture of what are the types of financial services that yeah. people are uh, using in DeFi. Like, what are kind of if you had to split it into a pie chart, like what are people doing in DeFi today? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is that there's remarkably few people doing anything in DeFi. I think there's fewer than 300,000 wallets or something that have ever interacted with Uniswap. Maybe it's a little more than that, but it's not many, right? It's extremely nascent for Mm -hmm. how much money is in the space, right? Mm -hmm. Like total value locked in DeFi is somewhere around $250 billion. Wow. But there's there's something like fewer than a million people who are moving around that money. So, you know, the first thing that's worth recognizing is some of the volatility comes from this like house money effect where there's a lot of people who, you know, maybe had a few thousand ETH when ETH was only $80 and they've ridden it up to $4,000 and they still have that few thousand ETH and now they're moving around $10 million, but it doesn't feel like $10 million. It still feels like, oh, this is just this little amount of money. Uh, so you, that's part of where these like crazy swings come from, and you know, there's a lot. Of, a lot of what's going on is a a, a generous form of degenerate gambling. Is probably right. uh, how we might describe it. But there, you know, aside from the degenerate gambling part, there are like simpler things that kind of like any you know average user can go do. So if we're going to make analogs to the traditional financial world there are a number of ways you could replace your zero interest fiat savings account with what you could call a DeFi savings account where it's still pegged to the US dollar. So you're not going to have the crazy value fluctuations that you might get if you're holding Ethereum or Bitcoin, but you're earning 5, 7, 10% APR on your dollars instead of, you know, what 0.3% that you're probably getting in a a fiat savings account. So, you know, at a very simple level, that would be like a good example of how somebody who's like dipping their toe into their space might do this. Uh, And it's funny, we actually did this on a previous, like every podcast live stream thing uh, with Evan, Mm -hmm. like just, you know, putting some money in. And uh, it's a nice way to get your feet wet because, Again, you're like not super exposed to crazy volatility and you're earning way more interest on your dollars than you would in a, a fiat savings account. Right. Yeah, we should check in on Evan. He invested a thousand bucks and it's probably, I mean, and, it, and it's like basically like a high yield savings account equivalent. Like it's not like he bought some coin that could really fluctuate in value a lot. And I mean, I bet it's compounded pretty good by now. It's been like, I don't know, six months maybe. 
Yeah, he DM'd me the other day because he was trying to figure out where we had put it. <laughs> That's one <laughs> problem with this space. It's like it's hard to track where you like put stuff sometimes. Right, so he was right, like, right. Yeah, where did we put that nine hundred dollars? Uh and I remembered and I pointed it out to him and it was up to like nine hundred and forty. So it's like pretty good for yeah. four or five months. It's definitely better than you would get at like Wells Fargo. Totally. Okay, this is this is really interesting and helpful. So when you say that uh one of the maybe like easiest starter use cases is for someone to enter into DeFi and to deposit money and earn more interest than they would from a tra- traditional bank account. Um, I guess the next question that comes up is where does that extra interest come from? Yeah. And why doesn't it exist offline? So the nice thing with the the good or bad thing with DeFi is that there there's no central bank and there's no Fed funds rate. So the the interest that we get in fiat world is pretty much determined by you know, how much the U.S. government charges banks to borrow money, right? So the Fed funds rate it's like what zero to zero point two five percent right now. Uh, so they can borrow money for free, uh, which means they're not really willing to pay you much of anything for you to give them money. Uh, so when you put your money in a fiat savings account at Wells Fargo or wherever, historically, banks would pay you some interest because they can turn around and give out loans uh, with your money and they can charge some amount on those loans, call it, you know, four or 5% was not uncommon historically. Uh, and then they could give you two or 3% and they take the float of you know 2% or whatever. If you go buy a house right now and you have good credit, you might be able to get a, lo- a mortgage for 2.5% fixed for 30 years, right? Which is insane, right? Like people ask a lot about like, why are DeFi yields so high? That That's not really the question. The question is how are interest rates so low in right. the US and how is that possibly sustainable? Because it's insane that you can borrow... 97% the value of a house for 30 years at two and a half percent, like below inflation, right? Like banks are losing money on this. It's absurd. Uh, but you can do it, which means nobody's going to pay you more than, you know, half a percent or whatever for money in fiat world. But there's no central bank in DeFi. Uh, no one's setting a Fed funds rate, which means the amount of interest you can earn for your money is whatever other is based on whatever other people are willing to pay to borrow it. So if you go to any of these like simple lending and borrowing platforms like Aave, uh, and I could just pull it up while we're talking, they have kind of like a very clear uh, rate that it costs at any given moment to borrow funds. And then based on how much it costs to borrow funds, they can tell you how much they will pay you to deposit funds. So I'm looking Makes at sense. Aave. I'm looking at Aave on Polygon right now. If you want to borrow USDC, uh, which is you know one of the many USD pegged stable coins, it'll you'll pay 3.8% variable uh, APR. So uh, it's higher than the two and a half percent that you get in fiat world. And it's, you know, variable and stuff so it can change, but it's not terrible. So it's 3.8, which means that if I go deposit USD into Aave, I will earn 2.98%. So Aave is making money on the difference between that 2.98 and that 3.88. So I guess that's about a 1% uh, float for them. Whereas like, Something like uh, on ETH, they only charge 2.3% to borrow it. So that's like pretty low. But if you deposit ETH, you only earn 0.4% interest, right? So it's all just based on supply and demand. If there's a ton of funds supplied for people to borrow, the rate to borrow them uh, goes down. If it's very you know tight and people are trying to borrow as much money as possible and nobody's supplying it, the rate to deposit it uh, or the APR you earn for depositing it goes way up. Uh, and so you can actually, well, you as a, a person can't really do this, but there are people who write code that arbitrage between these different borrowing and lending markets. So like, okay, you know, the deposit rate is this over here and it's this over here to borrow it. And so we can actually, for like one hour, we can borrow from here and put it over here. And because we're going to do it with $50 million, we're going to make a couple hundred grand, even over, you know, like a day or whatever of doing this. Um, and it ends up kind of like balancing out the market over time. And so you, you end up with pretty consistent rates across like the main borrowing protocols. Right. And is the thing you said about supply and demand really, really helps me a lot because it helps me understand why I'm thinking this is the case. I'm guessing it's the case. And I'm curious if you'll tell me if I'm right. It helps me understand why some things, the things that seem to be like very out to there, you can get crazy returns on for just lending. It's not even like you buy the coin and then the, you, the value of it can go up or down. It's like, you know, I'm let I'm I'm lending you my X coin, whatever random thing, 
And some of those are offering like really wild returns to be on the lending side. Um, and I guess the reason why that is, is because there's not a lot of people who have that coin and want to let other people borrow it yet. And so they don't have very much liquidity. And so there's, you know, the mismatch between supply and demand. So you as supply can go in and take advantage of the fact that there's not very many people offering that. Is that it? Or is there more to the story? Like what explains that? That's part of it. There's also, uh, so there's one product called uh, Rari. So it's like Rari.capital. And what's cool about them is they have these like uh, semi-autonomous borrowing pools where any protocol in DeFi can spin up a lending and borrowing pool for their native tokens. So, you know, if we launch like every coin, we could spin up a Rari pool where people can deposit their every coins and like borrow USDC against them. It's really cool, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing about that though, is that some, some of these pools are like incredibly degenerate for lack of a better way to describe it. Mm -hmm. um, and because people are borrowing funds to buy more of like highly speculative assets, they're willing to pay much higher interest rates for what they're borrowing. So I'm looking at one of them right now that's kind of like famous for causing crazy increases in wealth and also crazy destructions of wealth. And in it, people are happy to pay anywhere from 15 to 28% to borrow USD pegged stable coins right now, hmm. which is wild, right? But they think that the thing they are buying with those stable coins is going to go up so much that they don't care to pay 30% or whatnot. I've seen this pool at 100% where you could like put in, you know, you're just USDC pegged to the dollar and earn 1% every three days, uh, which is absurd. But people are willing to pay that much because they're taking really aggressive leverage on speculative assets. Uh, and the nice thing as you, the supplier of capital, is that you know in fiat world, if somebody comes to you and they're like, hey, I have this crazy startup idea, give me you know 20 grand and I'm going to like buy this stuff and try to do it. If it fails, you know, you're not getting your money back. The nice thing with these borrowing pools is if these people who are like, you know, leveraged to the gills get too far out uh, and, you know, end up underwater, their basically their ownership gets slashed and your funds are always protected. So, you know, they, they have very high risk, but you as the lender are much lower risk than you would be in like a peer to peer transaction outside of DeFi. It would be great to also talk a little bit about yield farming, like what what is that? How does it impact the APRs that people are seeing in DeFi? Where do those yields come from? Is there is there something else beyond just the counterparties that you're engaging with, the other people who are paying the interest rates? Yes. Yeah, so the way I think about it is that there there's like the the real interest rate that you can earn on stuff, and then there is the uh, like Ponzi nomics interest rate that you can earn on stuff. So. Uh, with yield farming, you know, yield farming is basically like an umbrella term to capture any behavior of looking around DeFi for how you can earn the highest interest on the funds that you have. So, you know, what I was just doing of like looking around at the different stablecoin pools, that would be like a basic version of yield farming where it's like, okay, I've got a, a big stack of stablecoins where it's worth the gas fee to move it around every week or two. Where's the highest yield on stable coins right now? I'm going to move it there, farm that for a few weeks, and then I'm going to go somewhere else. The base level of interest is always what people are willing to pay to borrow funds. But that usually caps out at maybe like 20% in a crazy bull market. But then you will see APRs that are 1,000 or 10,000% or whatever. And then people see that and they're like, well, this can't be real. And it kind of is real and it kind of isn't. Right. So what's going on in those situations is uh, basically the way that a lot of protocols release their tokens into the wild now is by paying people to help fund uh, trading of their tokens. So as a, as a simple example, let's say we're doing the every coin and we want people to be able to buy and trade the every coin, right? Coinbase and whatnot they are not going to list the every coin yet because you know they don't know yet they don't know if this is like a legit project i'll text brian we'll be in yeah, exactly. <laughs> make it happen all right they might they might list that one but for for another project right sure another project <laughs> yeah we would have to create the liquidity ourselves right. and i uh, you know the more the more liquid a trading pool the easier it is for somebody to come in if we 
if we created the the every coin and we said, okay, here's you know ten thousand every coins and here's ten thousand USDC. Those are in a trading pool. Go crazy. Well, the minute somebody buys what a hundred dollars worth of the coin, they're going to move the price by one percent. That's not ideal. Uh, we don't want the price to be like having these insane fluctuations. So we want a lot of liquidity so that people with you know fat stacks of crypto can come in and they can you know ape in a hundred a hundred thousand dollars worth of every coin without you know completely like throwing the price curve like out the window. So. The only way to do that is if you have, you know, millions of dollars of liquidity for your new token. Well, that's pretty expensive, right? Like, you know, we can, you know, team up, we can see like, okay, you know, how much money do we have to fund this liquidity? But uh, we probably don't have as much as we would want. And we might not even want to risk all of it because we don't know what's going to happen. Right. You know, we could immediately just like lose all of that if it goes south. So instead of us going out and raising, you know, $10 million to fund the liquidity for the every coin, we say, okay, we're, we're not going to release all the every coins at once. Uh, we are going to release them over four years. And we're going to slowly give them to the people who help fund the liquidity for our token. So, you know, everybody who reads the bundle could say like, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to help make your token tradable. I'm going to go buy some every tokens. And then I'm going to combine them with some of my ETH. I'm going to add them to the trading pool. And then I'm going to prove to you that I have done that by staking my uh, the tokens that represent my contribution to this pool on the every site. And then in return, I'm going to receive every tokens as basically as payment for me helping you, for helping the every bundle facilitate the liquidity in this pool. So this is a very common model, a very common way of distributing tokens into the market. And it's also where the insane APRs come from. Because just as a simple example, let's say that we launched the every token and we just came up with an initial arbitrary valuation of $10 million. And we're going to issue 10 million every coins over four years. And so we're going to you know, put out you know, some number of coins each day to everybody who helped fund liquidity. And let's so if every coin is worth a dollar and we're going to release, call it a thousand tokens a day. I know that math doesn't work, but just bear with me. Uh, we're going to release a thousand tokens a day. If I were the first person to help fund the every liquidity pool, and so I came in and I said, okay, here's here's a thousand dollars of liquidity. I'm going to stake it on the site, and because I'm the only person who does who's doing this right now, I'm getting all one thousand every tokens per day. Oh, interesting. So basically, we we have a fixed amount that we give out per day. And the mm-hmm. less people that help us, the more it goes to those people. It's like the it's like exactly. a fixed pie amount, and the more people we attract, the the more it goes down. So, but that's good exactly. anyway because we want to attract a lot of people. You want a lot of people, exactly. Right. And if the price goes up, right? So you might get ten times as many people contributing, but if the price is now ten dollars, the APR is the same, right? right? Yeah. So it, it, you get into this balance where if the token price is going up. In, in alignment with how much more people are adding to the pool, you can sustain pretty high APRs for a surprisingly long time. But if the price starts to drop uh, or if too many people come into the pool, then the APR is going to go down really quickly. Right. And you can almost use APRs as a proxy for like risk of a project because on a on a very established project that has been running for a while, has is pretty proven the APR for liquidity providers might only be 20, 30, 50% because only, <laughs> yeah, only <laughs> because it's like, it's de-risked a little bit and right. people are happy to, you know, stake for that amount because they know that this isn't like a risky protocol, but when something just launches and it's really early, it's not uncommon to see APRs that are like a few thousand percent because people have no idea what's going on yet. They don't want to take a risk on this new token. They're not like sure about the team. They might not have a product yet. And so you can have those crazy APRs for quite a while. Uh, and that's really where you start to see kind of like the, the, the crazy APRs come in. Now, the, the third variable here is the inflation rate. Mm. And the, the inflation rate is really, really important because if you, let's say that we have those 10 million every tokens, if we release them over one year instead of four years, well, now we're putting out four times as many per day, which means at the start, the APR is going to seem four times higher. 
But another way to think of it is that all the holders are just getting diluted four times faster, right? Mm. It's like having a real world inflation that's really high. Basically, like the APR is denominated in this particular token. It's not denominated in dollars. And so you can't really expect it to be like you put in $1 today, you get $1,000 at the end of the year. It's instead um, how many tokens of that like native protocol that you'll get within yeah. this time frame. If the price doesn't keep up, it's going to go down a lot. So Right, exactly. And that that kind of brings in the Ponzi nomic point where I, I've learned this phrase as I was researching Axie Infinity, which is growth dependency, which yeah. is a really nice way to put something that's Ponzi nomic is because <laughs> I, I think the interesting thing about the, the, the framing of Ponzi scheme is it feels like you're scamming someone, but the whole like growth dependent part of Axie's model is like, not a scam. Like everyone talks about it and knows about it. Like it's like a, it's just like a part of the model that they're like working with. It's like a part of the equation that's like, ah, oh, yes, we use this certain kind of jet booster to get off the ground. We have to transition to this other type of model or whatever. It's like, it's not at all a scam, but it is growth dependent. So yeah. I guess the point of that is if I give out my thousand every tokens a day to people who are, you know, staking to provide liquidity so that people can buy and sell every tokens, a lot of people come but the value of the token does not rise for whatever reason, that's the part where then people stop coming because mm-hmm. their, their AP, the APR goes down, basically. And so they're probably going to some other option that gives them better APR. And, and so that's the growth dependency is like, basically it's dependent upon the price of your token going up to keep up with the new people that are coming in. Does that, is that right? Or, or at least not going down so fast as to offset the APR. Right. Right. Exactly. And you're making it harder of, on yourself to make the value of your token go up when you're printing more of them on a more aggressive schedule, basically. Exactly. Is how that connects. Yes. Okay. So it's like when I when I did all of the staking contracts and like the tokenomics for crypto raiders, we did it over a four year schedule because we wanted the like daily addition to the supply to be like a very small percent of the like the outstanding circulating supply. Whereas it's a, it's not uncommon for projects to do like a one to two year schedule. Um, which you can do, but it's it's aggressive, and that's where you might see a project like go up really quickly, and then you know just kind of like crater off and plateau for a while. It, like the the time bias is pretty real, and like you said, as soon as the APRs like get bad, people are going to move their liquidity elsewhere, uh, which can really hurt a project. If you have people come in and you immediately get like thirty million dollars worth of liquidity, and like everyone's happy and awesome. And then the APR goes through the floor and people just take their funds elsewhere. Like that's not fun. So it's a, it can be a tough balancing act. Yeah. I wonder how far down the rabbit hole we should go. Like I kind of want to talk about DeFi 2.0 and Mm. protocol owned liquidity because that term has been flying around the Twitter sphere and I'm sure people have come across it. Um, Yeah. Maybe we should go there. Let's let's go there. Yeah. Okay. Great. What is it? I've never heard of this. Yes. Yeah, so uh, basically what I just described is the, uh, so there, there've been three evolutions of uh, what we, what we would call like uh, creating circulating token supply. Uh, version zero was the ICO, right? So, Hey, we have a new token. You pay us an ETH, we give you the token and now it's out there. But unless it got listed on an exchange or something, you were kind of SOL, right? Like who, who do you trade it with then? Version 1.0 is what I just described, which is incentivized uh, liquidity providing. So you want you know, $10 million in liquidity for your tokens. You drip it out. You drip out incentives over four years for other people to create liquidity. And the nice thing about this is you know, at least as we understand the regulations around like ICOs and stuff, it's kind of like a loophole because you're not, people are not paying you for your token anymore. They are buying it on a decentralized exchange. So the decentralized exchange takes on the liability and you are paying them for doing work by providing liquidity. So they're not like buying tokens from you, which like might be an unregistered security sale. You're just paying them for doing work like, you know, a 1099 contractor or something. So it's kind of like a clever workaround. Uh, but that's where we get into like the cur- the situation I just described of like liquidity providing and doling out incentives. The problem with that is uh, as like Zeus from Olympus would put it, is you're only renting your liquidity. So other people still hold all of it. And you have to pay them constantly to keep providing it. But you know, you could provide a million dollars of liquidity 
and just park it there for four years. And I'm paying you tokens for four years, even though you've done nothing else besides just leave that million dollars there. And I'll probably end up paying you way more than a million dollars over the four years because like the APR is going to be over 100% over four years. Right. And you can leave at any time. This person who's providing the million dollars yeah. or whatever, they, they, they don't have any obligations of any sort. Yeah, none. They could just unlock it, go somewhere else, you know, drain the pools, make it hard for everyone else to trade. It's not fun. So uh, protocol owned liquidity was pioneered by Olympus. And under this model, you allow users to sell their LP back to the protocol in exchange for uh, some in exchange for tokens vested over time. What's the LP? The liquidity provider, or the LP tokens. So, just as a simple example, let's say that you know we're back in the we're doing the every coin, and like I launch it, and you're providing liquidity for it, so. I you buy ten thousand dollars of every coin and you have ten thousand dollars of ETH. You put them into the trading pool on Sushi Swap, and Sushi Swap gives you a token that says, you know, you Nathan own this much of the Sushi liquidity pool for every and ETH, and it's like awesome. You can trade that back into Sushi at any time to get every and ETH back, uh, or you just hold it and you're earning trading fees and like life is good. But now me as like the every bundle, I don't like that because, you know, you have our liquidity, right? Like it's out floating around there. You control it. You could sell it at any time. It'd be better if we had all of it. So what I do is I say, okay, tell you what, I will pay you more every tokens for you to give me that LP. And I'll even give you like a 10% bonus. So if you have $20,000 of LP tokens, I will give you $22,000 worth of every tokens for your LP, but I'm going to drip it out over seven days. So you can't just immediately sell it on the market. Now, I have introduced more every tokens into the market without having to pay LP stakers. You are getting more of you know, ownership in the protocol, and you're getting a you know, 10% ROI in five days, which you know annualized is insane. And we control all of our liquidity now. It's not floating around out there. We're buying all of it from our customers. And just to quickly clarify this, like when you sell your liquidity to um, or to every, like you can't go back to Sushi Swap and get your ETH and every tokens back. There, like exactly. there's no recourse to do that anymore. There's no recourse. Yeah. They're I all see. in the every treasury. So if I sell my LP tokens then to like to the protocol, does the protocol have the ability to take to like to undo the transaction and to get the ETH and the every coin? Yep, exactly. Okay, cool. So whoever owns the LP tokens basically has the rights to the underlying assets that are in the liquidity pool. Yeah, think of LP tokens as like a receipt that anybody could take back to you know the pawn shop and get the asset back. And so by you trading those to the every treasury, the every treasury can accumulate all of their LP tokens. And then they're no longer renting $10 million of liquidity. They're sitting on $10 million of liquidity. Nobody can remove it because they control all of it. And on top of that, they are earning all the trading fees. So there's there's about like 0.35% you know, charged on every trade on a decentralized exchange. Now the every bundle has income from the fees charged on their liquidity, which you know, other people out there were earning before. So you not only own all of your liquidity and control your price volatility, you also have income from all the trading fees. It's a pretty sweet deal. So this is why people like Olympus. Yes, it's an incredible model. It's so smart, uh, but it got written off for a really long time because the APRs on Olympus were like insanely high. And so, I mean, this was my mistake. Like I, I found it really early on. I went and I looked at their page and I was like, this is, this is saying 60,000% APR. Like this is obviously some sort of just like weird culty Ponzi scam thing uh, and ignored it, which was really dumb. And then when they launched their pro bonds where any protocol could use their model to buy back their liquidity, that was when I kind of got it and was like, oh wait, this is actually just like fucking brilliant. <laughs> it's so smart. Um, and I think that like the, I think the model I originally described about like paying people to stake their LP tokens, that's going to be gone in six to 12 months. Everyone's going to switch to this because it's so much better. It does sound really, yeah, it sounds really smart. It's, it's like a very clever evolution, but then, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to just ask all the questions that everyone probably has in their minds. So why is 
ohm token, the token of Olympus, why is it not doing well? Why is it in this downward spiral? Well, so there's, I mean, there's two things to look at with Olympus. One is the market cap is more important than the price because it's a constantly rebasing token. And so the APR on Olympus is kind of fake because the Mm -hmm. APR is how quickly they are minting you additional Olympus tokens based on the amount of bond revenue they're collecting. So if you just look at the Olympus price, it definitely looks pretty bad recently and it is down, but the market cap is kind of like the more important thing because they're issuing so many more tokens that even if the price goes down, the market cap could still go up. So they're still at like, 1.7 1.7 or 1.8 billion dollars in market cap even though the price is down like 80% off of its high right and the, and when it was at its high the market cap was only like 3.8 billion so it's really only down like 50% even though the price appears to be down 80% so that's sort of like the first thing that's mm-hmm. wonky with their system and if you if you had tokens up when it was at $1000 or whatever and you held since then you're only down like 30% or 20% because of all the rebases that you got along the way. So your share of the protocol went up and you know the and like the number of tokens that you had went up. So it, it's a really weird like thing to think about right. and track. So the price is basically going down because they're printing a lot of tokens. And, and people are selling, right? P- people are selling right now because uh so the funny thing with Ohm is it, it's also like a heavily leveraged token and protocol. Like people borrow against it all the time. And uh, there are incredibly liquid pools for borrowing against it. So when we have a market downturn like this, the liquidations on it are insane. It gets hit so hard because people are just like borrowing really aggressively against it. And you can like look at the cascading liquidations that happen against Olympus when like the market turns down like this. And it's pretty brutal. Um, So that's part of it, too, is when we have a series of like continued downtrend like this, people get liquidated hard. Uh, and that ends up bringing down the price quite a bit too. The the thing that I think is like most interesting with Olympus is like the price to like risk free treasury value, because that tells you like what the monetary premium on the token is. I, I can't remember off the top of my head where it's at right now, but it's like extremely strong at the moment. And so even though it's like way down, it looks like it's going way down like fundamentals wise, it's in the strongest spot it's ever been. It was just kind of like, I think, overhyped and overbought a couple of months ago. Right. When everyone had three, three in their Twitter name. Yeah, exactly. And everybody was launching other Olympus forks and things like that. Really? That was a fun period. It was a good time. But why should Olympus capture the value of this innovation? Because the way you explained the difference in the model, it's like, oh yeah, that seems clearly better to me. But like, if anyone can do it, like, why should I you know, it seems like there's no like underlying thing that Olympus other than like, they've got their treasury. That's great. So like, but like they're even still, I'm guessing the price of their token is a lot higher than the value of their treasury, like in terms of, you know, ETH or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the cool thing with them is that they're also like, uh, incubating and spinning out tons of other projects and other protocols. So they're they're probably one of the most like prolific and active DAOs out there. Like it's really cool to see they, they've got this like like octopus mentality of like they're just gonna get their tentacles into everything in DeFi and help spin up all these cool new projects and they're gonna uh, they're gonna like bond shares of new projects as they launch. So they can own a little bit of the upside of everything. It's really cool to see how they're like influencing the whole space. So you know, you could say that by owning Olympus, you're owning a share in the future of DeFi. Uh, and that's kind of like the way I think of it as an investment is they're really leading the charge on a lot of these things and they're buying shares in a lot of these other uh, protocols or helping them bond them. And so like you don't even have to go out and try to make decisions on like what to buy as much anymore. If you just own a share of their treasury, you're owning a share in like all this new stuff that's launching, which is pretty neat. To the question about the underlying bonding technology, you're right that that's not very special. Um, It's it's not a super complicated contract. I actually wrote them up for Crypto Raiders so that we could like do it just ourselves because Olympus isn't on Polygon yet. So the bonding contracts aren't super complicated, but there are so many benefits to working with Olympus and like being in their network that if I had the option to work with them and pay them the three percent or whatever, I'd happily do it. What what are the benefits? Well, just being plugged into that network and 
you know, being kind of like marketed on their site as a bonding option for people. Because a lot of people will just go to Olympus Pro and shop for whatever bonds are the cheapest and then go buy that liquidity, sell it into Olympus, get their, you know, five day vested tokens and rinse and repeat. And, you know, you can earn like two to 5% in five days on random protocol tokens. You end up discovering new projects. It's kind of fun. It's like a front page for like cool new stuff that's launching that you can invest in. So they're kind of like a marketplace that has aggregated some, I was going to say demand, but I guess it's supply of liquidity. <laughs> um, but I guess- Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They've ag- no, I'd say they've aggregated demand for liquidity because okay. other protocols can go there and say, hey, we're going to pay you Alchemix tokens for bonds on DAI because we want more DAI in our treasury. And then you can say, oh, cool, here's some DAI. I'll take my Alchemix tokens. And then you know I might stake some of the Alchemix. I might sell it, like do whatever. But there's always new stuff launching. It's pretty neat. Super interesting. Um, I want to zoom back out and and start coming back to the surface of the rabbit hole. Um, so this is this is all very interesting. It sounds very revolutionary. I wanted to get your thoughts now on what needs to happen in order to accelerate DeFi adoption. How does this become just finance rather than this weird corner of internet finance? Um, And maybe that also ties into the limitations that DeFi has today. Yeah, I'm very, I'm a big fan of this uh, analogy that I think the Bankless team came up with of the DeFi mullet, where it's like, you know, pretty like, you know, Robin Hood style user interfaces in the front and then like DeFi craziness in the back. Uh, So there are some apps that are like starting to do this. Donut is a good one where... It's, it's just a mobile app that looks like Wealthfront, basically. And you can like one tap deposit your like fiat into Donut and then you're earning like 8% on it. And on the back end, they're using Yearn. And I think they're doing like a leveraged Yearn play, which is like a fairly low risk, fairly like proven model for earning like solid uh, stablecoin yields in DeFi. But to do it yourself requires like a decent amount of like DeFi familiarity, know how you need to have like a browser wallet, you need to be able to pay for gas fees, you need to like do all of this stuff. And most people are never going to do that. And most people are never going to like use the Ethereum chain either because it's, you know, it's so expensive and it's intentionally expensive, like for security and for moving high amounts of money around that we're just going to have better and better like user interfaces that kind of like obfuscate away all the DeFi stuff on the back end. So I think that we're like moving more and more in that direction. Uh, Argent is another good example where they're basically like building now a Venmo competitor where you can like send your friends stablecoin payments and also put those stablecoins into like 10% yield. I think it's also built on urine actually, but they're using like a ZK rollup. So there's no gas fees. So you can do it all for free. It's really, really slick. Um, but you don't have to like figure out, you know, managing a seed phrase, doing all this stuff, right? It's like yeah. when you when you go to Wealthfront they don't say like Wealthfront is like, you know, a PHP, no SQL, right? Like database right. operating, like nobody cares, right? And nobody's going to care if something's on Ethereum or Polygon or Solana or whatever in five mm-hmm. to 10 years, because they're just going to see like a nice user interface with all that stuff on the back end. So I think just as we get like closer and closer to that, uh, things are going to be able to like attract more and more people. Um, but there's, you know, the flip side of that is, if the incentives are good, people will figure stuff out, right? Like you had millions of people in the Philippines figuring out Ethereum wallets, bridging funds to the Ronin wallet to play Axie Infinity because it was better than the minimum wage there, right? And that's like a fairly complex technical procedure to do on a computer, let alone on a like Android phone. So as stuff gets built out on chain too, I think we're going to see more people like feel compelled to dive in and explore as well. I mean, even just the like getting 10% yield on stable coins, I find really like perks people's ears up because they probably got like a, a big savings account or something that's not earning any interest. And they're like, Oh, well like maybe I'll just you know, put some in there. Cause it'd be nice to be getting some interest <laughs> on it. Right. Even if you just put a little bit, the interest on that part alone is probably more than if you put yeah. the whole savings account in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. And I, I think the the other big thing that's been a barrier is just like gas fees and right. like layer two build outs and everything. Mm-hmm. And, 
you know, it's nice that like as of two months ago, we're at the point where you don't have to deal with Ethereum at all anymore if you don't want to, like, nor should you. I, I hardly ever do anything on the Ethereum main chain anymore because it's so expensive. So you yeah. can just send funds straight from an exchange onto Polygon or Arbitrum or wherever and or Solana, and you can just do stuff there for like no cost. And it's super fast and a way better user experience. And even that, I think, is going to bring in so many more people. Makes sense. Yeah, it's just funny because it's like, there's 250 billion in funds in there. So you you think that tons of people are using it, but it's like, no, there's a thousand incredibly rich people moving money around. Yes. And then a few hundred thousand like pretty wealthy people also moving money around. Uh, and then like a long tail of you know users, but it's still a very small number. Yeah. I mean, when every transaction costs like, you know, 75 bucks. <laughs> <it's>, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're not moving around like minimum 10, 20 grand on Ethereum, it's unusable. It doesn't matter how high the interest rates are. So I think that that's being able to not have to deal with that is going to be really, really helpful for increasing user adoption. We'd love to get your recommendations on some DeFi projects that our listeners should check out, especially if they're beginners. Like what are the apps that they should have on their radar or play with if they're just getting started in DeFi? Yeah, I think the like the easiest magic experience is getting some crypto on and you you can't do it on Coinbase right now, which is so annoying. They haven't built any layer two bridges. But if you get some crypto on like crypto.com or Binance or I think Maybe Gemini is doing it too, or Kraken. Uh, you can send it straight from there to Polygon, mm -hmm. which is you know sort of a layer two on Ethereum, but transactions are complete in like a second for a tenth or a hundredth of a cent, right? Like it's a wonderful user experience. And you can go on Polygon and you can go to Aave, just aave.com. You can deposit your USDC or your ETH or whatever, and you're immediately earning like two to 10% interest on it. It takes like five minutes to set up and then your stable coins are just earning interest. Uh, and I think once you have that like basic experience and you're like, oh, this is pretty neat, then you get a little bit more interested in like going down the rabbit hole further, right? Because then you can start to get a little crazier and you can say like, okay, right. well, how do I like provide liquidity, right? How do I like go after one of those 200% APRs? How do I like borrow against my ETH and like do, you know, leverage stuff? How do I like buy NFTs and play games and things like that. But just getting the basic experience of saying, I've got like $1,000, I'm going to go earn 10% on it. And I'm just going to like watch that interest come in. Like that part I find is just so magical to people that it, it makes them excited to do everything else after that. So just, you know, doing one of those easy on ramps to a layer two, putting some money in Aave, watching it go up a little bit. That's like a really solid, I think, entry point. Awesome. If you want to talk about like, speculative, exciting new things on the horizon, like DeFi 2.0 stuff, we can do that too. But <laughs> I figure this is like- No, I think that's a good place to start. It's, it's a better, yeah, that's a better recommendation than what I started with, which is I I first started in DeFi by just like aping into this thing called Pickle Finance and trying nice. to like stake things into pickle jars. I had no idea what was going on. Yeah, Pickle's kind of complex. Yeah, it, it was very complicated. I think it's just starting with uh, also like swapping tokens on Uniswap or Sushi, seeing how to use a decentralized exchange um, is a good place to start. And then, yeah, there's also a few recommendations in a recent tweet storm that I wrote for DeFi products on Solana and Polygon, both of which have lower transaction fees than Ethereum. Yeah. Um, maybe we can link that in our show notes too. It's amazing, just like, I know we're wrapping up, but like, it's amazing how many little gotchas there are that once you do it a couple times, like just making the most basic transactions, it's like, and you know, signing up or connecting a wallet, like, and then, oh, how do I do it if I'm on my phone or whatever? There's so many little things that are like, no one has wrinkled that complexity to make it nice yet that I feel like is yeah. still such low hanging yeah. fruit. Like I set up my wallet on MetaMask and then I was looking around because, you know, I didn't want to start with very much money. So I was like, uh, let me try something on Solana first because it's like cheaper transaction fees or whatever. I didn't even realize like MetaMask is for Ethereum and I have to get some other wallet like for Solana. Oh, yeah. like, there's yeah. so many things it's that like just like aren't universe. explained anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I didn't even realize that my wallet was like not controlled by MetaMask. I can actually also use like the Rainbow app on my phone to control the same wallet as long as I have the seed phrase. It's like blew my mind and I don't know just there's so many little things that are like weird conceptual differences that you have to learn and once you learn them you instantly forget that it was ever confusing almost and so yeah. I feel like the people designing these products are like 
don't realize how many steps are like actually quite confusing because you just they have to be explained to you and they just they're not explained in the UI. So eh. the other thing that that does go away for people like just getting into it is the like feeling of terror when you do anything. Yeah, <laughs> like it, it, it like starts off very scary. And you're like, oh, my God, like what's happening? Am I going to lose all my money? Like, where is it going? Like, it, you know, just like terrified of anything going wrong and then you just get used to it and then stuff just feels normal and kind of like fluid and second nature and then every now and then you have to like stop and pause and i you know i mentioned the whole house money thing at the beginning and i think that is still a really big factor in crypto where it's like for a lot of people they're you know they're moving around nfts worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars, but it doesn't feel like two hundred fifty thousand dollars to them anymore right right they think in the eth instead of dollars yeah, yeah, exactly. You're thinking in ETH instead of dollars, or they've never pulled it out into their bank account. And so it's, you know, it doesn't feel like it's real money. So I, I also wouldn't be like discouraged by seeing people with like huge stacks doing stuff in crypto either, because a lot of them were just like super early and have ridden it uh, yeah. out until now. So absolutely. Um, let's end with some recommendations on books, articles, and other educational resources that you would recommend for folks who want to gain a more nuanced understanding and maybe deep dive into some of the topics that we touched on today? Uh, yeah, I'm going to do the annoying thing and just say, go to the first D Friday and read back from there. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I, uh, I do have a few articles at the beginning that I think are good intro points. They are ETH focused, so I'd probably recommend trying to adapt them for Polygon or Solana. Um, I do have DeFi orientation, but you don't have to spend the hundred dollars to do it if you want to just figure stuff out yourself. To be honest, though, like putting a bit of money into a wallet and hopping in and just like playing around is going to do the most. I don't know if there are any good books, really. There are definitely good articles out there, but um, I, I definitely think just like playing around is going to teach you the most, the fastest. Actually, you know what? My friend wrote a really good article about this. Yeah, here we go. Uh, hands on Ethereum. If you Google hands on Ethereum day, yeah, this is a really good article by my friend Zach about just like doing some basic stuff, getting set up, um, and playing around with a few like common protocols. So I'll definitely check that out. Amazing. Awesome. Um, this has been super helpful, Nat. Thank you so much for taking us through a quick journey of DeFi. Um, and yes, for, for everyone who's listening, I think there's so we just scratched the surface and there's just so much many more levels of detail and other niches that you can go into. Um, so we'll link some resources in our show notes and hope you enjoyed it. And let us know if you have any other questions or topics that you want us to dive into. But thanks a lot, Nat, for coming on the show. We really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Talk soon.